Okay, folks, uh, today we're going to get the semester started by talking about uh, science and the scientific method. Now, I know, I hope, that you have heard this lecture a couple times already at this point in your life. Okay, you've had X number of science classes in school. Um, you definitely had some in high school. Uh, you may have even had one or two on campus here. And that's okay, because you, you can't hear this stuff enough. Um, and everybody has a, a slightly different take on it. And, and after we're done talking, you're going to be like, well, how could, you know, science is science, and that, that's what it is. You just gave you these strict set of guidelines and rules, and how could it change from teacher to teacher? That, that, the rules don't change. But the way we present it to you, the way we explain it to you does, and, and the more different ways you hear it, um, hopefully the better you'll understand it. And this is more of a, I don't want to say problem, uh, but more of an issue than, than ever um, with you guys having more and more access every moment of every day to, to more information quicker, faster, uh, not necessarily better than, than any other generation before you guys. Um, hell, if I wanted to argue with something my science teacher told me, I had to actually go get an encyclopedia or something like that and, and, and look and see if they agreed with Funk and Wagnalls, okay? Um, now you could just type something into your, your little pocket computer and get 5,000, if not 50,000 um, different answers, a fraction of which are probably accurate. That's the scarier part. Um, so you guys need to be able to leave college, especially as non-science majors. Science majors, I'm not too worried about you. But the non-science majors, when you go out there uh, and you're absorbing all this information being thrown at you, talked to you, um, let alone when you go on, if you choose to go on and raise kids, um, you need, to, you need to understand stuff. This has been extremely magnified during the last couple of years with COVID. Unbelievable. Um, I, I'm old. I'm on Facebook still. I don't do too much of those other platforms. But, uh, you know, found myself, I don't know how many times, trying to defend, in quotes, science because what I thought were extremely intelligent friends of mine had no freaking clue of the process and they believe whatever talking head is talking to them that they happen to like think is funny or think it knows what they're talking about and who aren't scientists either um, you guys had a very unique opportunity to actually live through science um, for better, for worse, for, for everything in between. And we're still living through science. Um, it's a long process. It isn't three months. And that was a huge part of the problem. We were forced to accelerate. They were forced to accelerate. And uh, every time they'd say something different. They'd be like, those damn scientists don't know what the hell they're talking about. They change their mind every other time. They don't agree with one another. Well, as you're going to see in a couple minutes here, that, that's the process. We have to hash it out, preferably over a beer. We didn't have time to do that either. All right? You got to go back and forth. You got to look at the data. And as more data comes in, you know what? Sometimes the answer changes. That's the point. But it's never been broadcast like that before. Never closest thing to it was polio back in the 50s. I think it was the 50s, 40s and 50s. When they, when they got the, the vaccine and, and finally people stopped dying. Um, anywho, so you guys, very unique perspective. Uh, like I said, I've been teaching 20 some odd years and uh, you guys, like I said, are very unique in that, in that, uh, category. So, 
What does science mean to you? Does it only have one definition? Yeah, you could probably go to the back of your textbook and um, look up a definition, okay? And in fact, I encourage it at some point just to see how far off it uh, differs from what we say. But you guys tell me, what's, what is science? How do you science something? Okay, research, facts. How do we get the, well, let's hold on to the facts for a minute. Re what's, what's research mean? Somebody else. What's it involve, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Okay, okay, so that's what you are researching. I'm asking even, a, that, and that's, that's for sure. I'm asking even a more fundamental question. What is researching? What does it mean to research? Yeah. Collect data. Okay. All right. We'll go with that too. So collect data. We're going to research about a question we have. Um, and what did you say? First thing it was, um, I said we'll hold off on it. Facts, in order to get to some facts. Does that sound like science? All right, we're gonna research some stuff, we're gonna gather some data, we wanna answer a question, and we wanna get some answers. Sounds like you guys read my PowerPoint before you walked in the door, that's awesome. Um, yeah, more or less, okay? More or less. Um, what I was trying to poke around at, and no one was taking my, my bait, was, was what does it mean to, to research? And it, it used to mean going to the library and uh, reading up on as many old journals as you could. Find out what's already been talked about, what, what people already know about it. Um, I thought somebody might say that magical word experiment, okay? And I didn't want to hear that because research should really come before the experiment. Research helps you design the experiment. Um, so you guys have gone, you know, like I said, and, and, and maybe it's because of, of, of the talk I gave just a minute ago. Maybe it's because of going through the last couple of years, you guys um, gave a much better answer, group answer, uh, than I usually get. Um, usually we end up with the study of stuff, more or less, all right, the study of stuff. And uh, I have to say then, okay, well, how, how do we study this stuff? And you guys, well, very carefully, okay. Um, is there a way that we're supposed to study? Is there a, a, a method? perhaps, that we're supposed to use. Anyone else know? Does that method have a name? Scientific, Scientific method. method, okay. So it's the study of stuff in a very particular way that, that we're going to walk you through here in a couple of minutes. But like I said, I, I like your guys' answer better. It was, it was nice and complete. So to, to answer this bottom question, no, okay? There are a handful of times this semester when I'm going to ask you to say something verbatim. And this is not one of them. All right, science, you know, there's some core things in there that we need to hear when we're talking about what science is. But otherwise, you know, you're, you're, you, can, you can improvise a little bit as long as we hear the, the important bits, like I said, which are, which are coming. My Latin's horrible. I wanted to take it in, in high school, um, but the uh, guidance counselors didn't think that I was uh, math and science track for, for whatever reason, um, probably because I was very lazy. And uh, they made me take Spanish instead. So my experience from pronouncing Latin pretty much comes from going to church on Sundays. But I'm going to say this word is siere, sire perhaps. I'm going to say siere. Anybody take Latin? Well, my daughter's starting it this spring, so maybe she'll be able to tell me how to pronounce it after a couple semesters. Um, the root word of science means to know. Okay, and that's the important bit, regardless of how poorly we mispronounce it. The root of science means to know. So that study of stuff definition really wasn't too far off, okay? As much as I teased the other classes for, for coming up with something so generic, 
but the study of stuff in a very particular way because we want to know. Now, geology itself is, it, earth science itself, really earth science in the broader sense, is very unique in that we've been sciencing a lot longer than some of the other fields. Um, they just didn't really know they were doing it at the time. If you think back through all of your previous classes when you learned about this ancient guy and that ancient guy and some other ancient guy and ladies, yeah, it was pretty much ancient guys because back then they, they didn't let ladies do a whole heck of a lot, right? There's a few, especially again in, in, uh, in earth science. We have a few famous ladies uh, that did a lot of uh, paleontology stuff, fossil work. Um, but for the most part, it was, it was old rich guys, right? Why? Free time and money, all right? Those are the guys that got published. Those are the guys you hear about in class. But everything else, a lot of our, like when we talk about any of the surficial stuff, like we're going to talk about glaciers and mountains and, and this, that, and the other thing, anything that you could observe from the surface, we've been studying since we've been staring at it, you know? Um, and, and a lot of these, I call them early observationists. They weren't scientists. They didn't know about the scientific method. But they were staring at stuff. They were thinking about why it is, what it is. And they came up with stories, sometimes rather silly, sometimes quite wrong, sometimes scarily accurate. So we've been doing science for a long, long, long time in our, in our science. Stuff where you needed the microscopes and the telescopes for that, that came along a lot, a lot later. So we, we've had a foundation built way back, way back. So, we, we dragged this horrible word out a couple minutes ago, the scientific method, and yes, you're going to have to remember the steps just like you did in every other science class, and I apologize for that. It's going to be like one or two questions on the test. The annoying part of this is, is that not all your teachers have the same amount of steps in the scientific process, in, in, in the um, scientific method. And it's only because some of us take one thing for granted and, and some of us don't. And I'm in the don't pile. Um, because I teach primarily non-science majors, um, I start with an extra step that, that one of you guys actually already sort of alluded to. And we'll get there in a minute. But, so if you think you remember the scientific method and I have one more step, I, I apologize. I guess that's what I'm getting to. So what is the scientific method? The scientific method is an orderly logical approach to gathering and analyzing data about a problem or question at hand in order to arrive at a logical solution, right? That's a nice big wordy sciencey definition. I'm not gonna have you regurgitate that, don't worry. But I, I think it hits on all those notes that we've been talking about, right? There's a method. That's that first thing, an orderly logical approach. That's a method. What are you doing? You're, you're getting data. You're thinking about the data. And you want an answer. Makes sense. You just made it sound scary and formal. All right, so how do we do that? Like I said, I have an additional step. My additional step is to acknowledge that there's a problem or a question that needs to be acknowledged, okay? Some people just skip right over this and assume, well, duh, you're, you're studying something already. I, I just stick this in here. It's not earth shattering, life changing, anything like that, all right? But I do it for a reason. I do it for a, a talking point, if, if you would. Because there's a couple things you hear over and over again that are kind of irritating to, to scientists. And even though I'm not a scientist, I, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, right? I was trained in the scientific method, but I'm a teacher. So I, I say us every so often, but I mean them. So what we hear a whole lot of times, um, and for those of you frantically trying to write all this stuff down, 
this is what the PowerPoints are. If I, if I don't have them up yet, I apologize. You'll have access to everything that's on here. And if you want to write it all down, you, you can. All right, but, but rest assured, you will have access to these words. And what that does is it frees you up to write other stuff, so the things that I'm saying that, that aren't on there. Okay, um, Just as a heads up, and I, I forgot to say that, but um, you will have access to, to these slides. Um, so what do we hear all the time? We hear that uh, uh, there's, there's nothing left for science to study. Well, again, right now that's kind of hard to believe. We've got COVID, right? Uh, but, but I always, my, the go-to is, you know, we still have people dying from cancer. We still have people uh, starving in the world. We've got uh, some obvious uh, things happening with our climate. Um, there's, there's plenty of stuff still to figure out. And then that's just hitting three high notes right there. Okay, so nothing left for science. No. Um, and then science for science's sake. That's the other one that, uh, and I'm not going to give you a sufficient answer for this, but it's, it's easy to understand. It's easy to understand how people can get upset, especially if you know, they think tax dollars are involved and such. Uh, I don't know if you remember what I told you the other day. Uh, my research in grad school I studied zebra toes, okay, ankles technically, and one toe. The horses stand on their, their middle finger, right? Um, so I studied the middle finger and ankle bone of zebras. Pretty proud to say that, right? Who else can, can spend what's grad school cost, $60,000 and two years of your life? But that's not why I went. I went to learn a process. I went to learn this, that, and the other thing. But not too long before that, I had the, the audacity or whatever that, that, that a, that a early 20 year old has to get stuck in the front of the van with your, you ever get stuck in the front of the van with your teacher or the front of the bus? Some of you like it, some of you don't. Um, it's not bad for short trips, but we were going from one corner of Ohio to the other for a field trip. So eventually ran out of stuff to talk about. And I asked him what, what he did for his, he had a doctorate, not just a master's. I said, what did you study? He said, blah, 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 some big Latin long name. I knew it was paleontology already, but I said, well, what? He's giant clams. I said, okay, that's, that's kind of cool. Giant clams, what, what did you do? That, oh, I was just, you know, naming a new species. And, and whatever, I said, how does that help the, the greater good? And, and, and he, he stuttered and stammered and, he didn't have a good answer either. You know, how is what you're doing helping society, right? And, and, and I, again, I could easily say the same thing about my zebra toes. And I'll give you the same answer that, that he gave me, you know, contributing to the larger body of knowledge of humans. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's not solving cancer, right? Um, but, but not everything has to, not everything does. It's all part of this bigger process. Um, and, and like I said, that's, that's not a justification. It's, it's just some things just are. But in the end, there's, there's plenty of worthwhile science going on. And this, the idea of identifying this problem, just to get back on target for a second, you're not going to run out of things to study because for the most part, we're, we're bent on improvement. Right? Revisions. You're not going to see things change drastically. A few things have. We no longer prescribe leeches for a variety of things like we used to do. There are still, believe it or not, a few instances where doctors will use leeches. But, you know, you're not going to go down to the corner barber and, and get leeches for your cough anymore. Okay? We, we figured that one out. It's a silly example, but it's a great example all the same. So you're basically new and better. And that goes hand in hand with technology. Um, you guys here in geology right now, we don't talk too much about space. We'll, we'll a little bit. But in my earth science class, um, we have a whole unit on astronomy. And that and technology literally evolved hand in hand. Uh, Great example is our uh, closest stellar neighbor, okay, and um, whose name just jumped out of my head at the moment. Ah, Centauri, okay, Alpha Centauri. 
When we first looked at it, we said, wow, there's a really big bright star over there about four light years away. Very cool. That appears to be our closest gal uh, galactic neighbor. And da 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 da. Then we'll say a decade or two later, telescopes got better. And they said, holy cow, um, that's actually two stars. Okay, well, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. They didn't want to entirely admit their excuse, but, you know, or admit their uh, mistake. But we'll call them the same thing. Just put an alpha and a beta next to it. Another couple decades later, they find out there's actually a third star. All right, we had binary system, tr trinary is not a word, but we're moving up now to a, a, a trinary system, right? Now there's three stars that are actually our closest galactic neighbors. And they found out that the third one that they just found is actually a hair closer. It's like 4.2 instead of 4.3 light years, which that's a lot of change, really, when you're talking about light years. Um, so they call that Proxima. It's a little closer to us, Centauri. Technology changes science. Science is what makes technology. It's, it's really self-feeding. And that's yet another reason why this process keeps changing and why this process hopefully will never end, not just to keep scientists employed and out of the private sector, but it's we are furthering the greater body of mankind. I'm trying to tie it back to that. It's you know, we're sorting stuff out there and sorting stuff out for folks. So you don't have to come up with new problems. Every so often one presents itself though, right? All right, so gathering and analyzing data. Uh, I kind of gave you a foreshadowing on this one. This is step two. Uh, and, and it used to be library work, okay? Or going to conferences and listening to people talk. But nowadays, you got the interwebs, okay? And you could Google. Lord knows you all know how to Google stuff. The problem nowadays isn't getting your hands on the information. It's sorting through it, good, bad, and indifferent. So, problems change a little bit over the years. But you don't want to rebuild the wheel, as they always say. Let's say for some silly reason, you want to go to grad school and, and figure out uh, why the sky is blue. Okay, Somehow you made it this far in life, you don't know why the sky is blue. And actually, I'm, I'm not teasing you, but I bet like three quarters of you don't know why the sky is blue. Um, but let's say... You don't know why the sky is blue, and, and, and that's what you're going to grad school for, when literally a 30-second Google would tell you it's because our atmosphere is primarily nitrogen, and nitrogen is about just the right size to bounce blue wavelengths around more than any other color. Oh, I guess I don't have to go to grad school now. All right, so silly example, but you want to make sure you're not doing everybody's work over again. That being said, when you read somebody's paper, you're like, what, what do you think? Why would you do? You should have done, right? And like you're watching a TV show and you can't believe they made that mistake. We just finished uh, watching Better Call Saul, and some of the things I'm like, oh my god, why did you just, why? All right. Well, same thing happens when you're reading somebody's research. Sometimes, boom, there's a great place for you to start. Say, okay, let's do redo what Smith and Wesson et al. did, but let's go this direction instead of that direction and see what happens. You're allowed to do that as long as you acknowledge that you're building on their work. So that's gathering and analyzing data. A lot of times folks think, um, like I said, I introed it a little different this time, but if I just ask you guys that, you're like, oh, it's from your experiment. No, you haven't even done an experiment yet. Haven't even done that yet. So this is, this is research, in quotes. This is just like going to the library. Formulate a hypothesis. Three-part harmony, everyone. What's a hypothesis? An educated guess. That was not a three-part harmony, but she sounded good, right? An educated guess. Please do not write that down. That's horrible. But that is exactly what you guys have been told all, all these years, right? All right. Um, I'm not going to give you anything much better. But it's slightly less insulting. Educated guess. It's the guess part that we have issues with. We're not guessing. And I hope by the time we get done discussing this that you realize they're not guessing. Okay? And they just throw educated in front of it to make it sound, well, they're guessing and they went to college, so they're, they're smart-ish. 
No, it's not an educated guess. Tentative explanation formulated to explain the observed phenomena based on the data collected. That's overly wordy. I, I understand. Okay. And how is that different? Tentative explanation. Seems we will. Betty. When I first. Um, uh, kid I met very early on in my college career, ended up being a good buddy for many, many years. I first met him, we were at a party, he said, hey man, how's it going? What do you do? Who are you? What do you do? Kind of thing. He says, oh, my name's Willie. I'm a petroleum flow technician. I said, petroleum flow technician? That sounds cool. What, 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 do, what do you do? Well, I pump gas. Okay. Petroleum flow technician, pumping gas, educated gas, tentative explanation, same thing, sound one sounds a little better. Um, it just, you know, six of one, half dozen of the other, as they say. But this explains it a little further. It's, it's indicating that you did do some research. It's indicating that it is possibly going to change. So that's why it's a little better, I think. So you got a hypothesis, or hypothesis, as you guys like to say sometimes. What are you going to do with it? Well, you want to prove it, right? How do we prove our hypothesis? How do we test it to see if it's good? What do you got to do now? The thing you've been wanting to say for like 20 minutes. An experiment, yeah. All right? That's the next step, is, is you design an experiment. Um, this is actually the hard part. It really is. Uh, the, the thing about experiments is you've got to make sure they're not designed to prove your point, if that makes sense. Uh, remember the, the game Mousetrap? You may or may not have played it as a kid or seen it in a corner at your grandparents' house or something. you got this whole itch. I, I could never play the game. I just like to set it all up and let it go off. For those of you that don't know, Mousetrap is um, really a, a, what they call a Rube Goldberg device. Um, Rube Goldberg device you would see in, in movies, usually about a, a smart kid, again in, in air quotes there. Um, what happens? The, uh, they, the movie opens with uh, panning to somebody buried in sheets on a bed and an alarm goes off and they, they whack the alarm and, and doing that pulls a string. The string sets a bowling ball loose. The bowling ball bumps into an iron which burns through a string and the string 23 things later, it opens a can of food for the dog or something like that that the kid was too lazy to, to do. All those steps, all those devices, <coughs> in order to achieve a simple thing, that's, that's a Rube Goldberg machine. And there was a gentleman, Rube Goldberg, who used to draw stuff like that decades ago. And it was entertainment. It was funny stuff. All right. And Mousetrap is, is exactly like that. All these different contrivances all set up to make that little mouse trappy thing go down. You got to make sure you're not doing that when you design your experiment. You can't purposely prove your point. It has to almost highlight it. It has to happen by accident. And, and we've got checks in place for that. Despite what Hollywood will have you think, um, Scientists do share. Everything's not secret research, okay? Uh, there are certainly some fields. If you're working on a cure for cancer, you're definitely going to keep that close to your community. You're not going to be, hey, somebody across the continent, what do you think of this at a competing company? No. Perhaps a little later in the trials, after the trials. But people within your own circle, you know, you, you've, you've got them there. And they bounce things off of one another to make sure that you didn't accidentally do this. We use the term uh, bias. Yeah, right there. It has to be unbiased. Uh, an easy example of what a bias is, there's not a whole lot of pinball machines left on the planet, but you know what a pinball machine is, right? Hopefully you've played one. Kind of fun. Kind of stressful. The ball's coming down the side, and it's right over by your flipper. It's either going to go on the alley 
the gutter or it's going to roll down your flipper side, right? What do you do? You, you whack the machine just a little bit to get it to roll over that way. That's a bias. All right. And you need to make sure that you don't have to do that as well in your experiment. You got to flick the test tube three times, you know, in order for it to, to work or something like that. Now, don't get me wrong. You can have all the controls you want, but it can't be purposeful. And it's, it's tough. Anyway, I'm, I'm giving it way more time than this slide needs, but, but the gist is, you know, long and short of it is, is it's got, an experiment's got to be done a very particular way, and uh, you got to have people check it. So two things could happen at this point, right? Uh, your experiment could fail, or your experiment could uh, succeed. <coughs> what is, sorry, I haven't talked this long in a while. <clears throat> what is failing and succeeding? That's supporting or not supporting your data, right? So what do you do if you don't sh support your data? What would you guys do? Anybody, everybody. What would you do? No need for hands even, just say something. Throw it. Oh, go ahead. Redesign the experiment. Red so I was just going to say, would you throw it all away and redesign the experiment? Would you check your math? Would you run the experiment like 12 more times just to be sure? You may have assumed we already did that. All right. Chucking it all is, is the last resort. Because think about all the work, again, you put into it. It really should work, right? You, you, you thought you knew what you were doing. You did all this research. Um, it, it really, check and make sure you didn't mess something up. Forgot to carry the one, right? Something silly like that. But yeah, at some point you may have to say, okay, this, this isn't right. Something's, let's, let's go back to the drawing board, as they say. So that's, that's the, the negative loop. We don't want to go there. Let's say your evidence supports it. Time after time again, you've done it not once, but 300 times. That's another thing. Science takes Time. Going back to that educated guess and hypotheses and so on and so forth, science takes time. And you're not doing this for free, right? Science takes money. And more than one person. I'm building to something, just bear with me. So science takes more time, money, and, and people. So your, your evidence supports your hypothesis. You've run the experiment multiple times. You've had your friends look at your data, your colleagues, I should say, look at your data. You may have even gone to a conference or two, presented it. And everybody seems to think, hey, that's all right. I should have asked this question, but I just gave you the slide to say, what's the next step? It becomes a theory, all right? A theory. For all of the grandiose definitions we've had so far, a theory is just a hypothesis supported by experimental data. A hypothesis supported by experimental data. And I accidentally used the just word myself because I was just about to go off on a rant about whenever we, they always use the word just before theory. And talk about driving a scientist bonkers. It's just a theory, but dot, dot, dot. What do we just say you went into this at this point? How many years do you think you're into it at this point? Okay. A lot of people's time, money, people hours, halves of lives, are spent by the time you get to a theory. Theories are, I don't want to say all we've got in science, because there is another step. What's the next step, the higher step? A theory can become a, no, 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 no facts. No facts. I'll go out, that's another rant. She's close, so what's the, what's the word? Uh, the blank of gravity, the blank of thermodynamics. Laws, yeah, we get laws, all right? That's the higher step. But everything else is a theory. 
that book you just paid, what do the books cost this semester? Somebody buy one here? You guys all rent, huh? I'm doing that with my son now. It's $30 to rent or $5,000 to buy, right? What are you going to do? Um, that textbook that probably would have cost you 100 bucks, 130 bucks, is full of theory. It's not full of facts, all right? And for folks that come from different majors, that can be very stressful at times. I've had people over the years, and that's why I've actually added this little bit into my conversation. I say, why am I going to spend $100 on a book that, that's not full of facts, that's full of, that's full of just theories? That's all we got, man. It, it, that's what science makes, is theories. Um, and that's, that's some pretty heavy stuff, if, if not expensive and everything else that I've tried to point out. The problem is, is that we've, over the, the years, we've, we've undermined the word. We've, I don't want to say used it incorrectly, but let's say it's Saturday night and you're getting ready to watch a movie and, and your buddy leans over and says, dude, where are the Doritos? Like, I have a theory. No, you don't. At best, you have a hypothesis as to where the Doritos are. You do not have a theory, all right, unless you spent an inordinate amount of time Saturday afternoon researching it, which you probably didn't. And like I said, and then all these talking heads out there in the world saying, it's just a theory. Scientists have a theory, but it's just a theory. No. All right. So a lot of, much of what we talk about is theory, but you've got to be okay with that. And, and that's what makes, if you've met a handful of scientists, again, not teachers, but actual scientists, they're a different breed. They're, they're some different critters. They really are. Bless their hearts. They need to be. Okay, because if you spent your entire life studying something, or at least the last 30 years of your life studying something, and some 24-year-old comes out of grad school and doesn't exactly disprove it, but points out something that you've just completely and utterly missed, it takes a special kind of person to say, let's have a beer and you explain that to me, instead of going up top of a clock tower with a rifle and we don't want to go there. All right, but or jumping off of it, you know what I'm saying? It, it, it takes a special kind of person to say, "Oh my God, how did I miss that? How cool!" Instead of getting incredibly upset, they are different. They're wired differently to think about things, and and sometimes that's hard to make the transition. You come in here as a as a business major or a social major, and you're like, "What what are these people talking about?" Especially to get into like physics and chemistry, mind-boggling stuff. Mind-boggling. But some people can process it better than others, and they they gravitate to that field. All right, I do, lest I digress. So we got a theory, and a theory, like I said, is 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 what you get, with very few exceptions. We mentioned the law of gravity. I mentioned thermodynamics. What other laws are there? Usually, you guys can come up with one or two more. The laws of yeah, I was gonna say motion. Laws of attraction. I'm trying to think if that was you're talking like love, or if you're talking about physics. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, laws of attraction. There's a handful. Okay, laws of motion, like Newton. People usually come up with Newton. Newton's laws, um, and and there's like six more, right? There's more than six, but there's not a whole heck of a lot, is my point. Becoming a law is, there's no time limit. Okay, this has been true for 100 years. We used the word fact a couple minutes ago, right? This has been a fact for 100 years. No one can argue with it. Uh, therefore, we bump it up to a law officially. Congratulations. No. <coughs> but kind of, yeah. And it's okay because it's just a title. It really doesn't mean anything more than, yeah, this is a theory that really has stood the test of time so far. And, and here's where we blend into the, to the nature of science, the philosophy behind it all, which I started to talk about when, when I said how scientists are different kind of folk. And I say that in a positive, loving way, please, believe me. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, it's the it's, it is a philosophical thing, which you don't want to hear about. You're like, no, wait, we're talking about science. How can we be talking about philosophy? It's it's they're very related, very related. We totally skipped over the whole science and religion conversation, by the way. We'll try to work it into this nature of science bit here. So, segue, nature of science. All right, theories and laws are not absolute. There are no truths in science, all right? And substitute fact in for truth quite, you know, easily. And that's because of what a truth means philosophically. It's what a fact means philosophically. There are no absolutes. Uh, there may be, but you won't know until the absolute end whether or not it was absolute, right? I didn't mean to reuse the word, but you get where I'm going with that. Um, so, this is overly dramatic, and as such, um, you know, I kind of I put some strike throughs in it a, a semester or so back. A theory or law can be disproven at any time. I think I wrote this the first semester I was teaching, back when we didn't know all caps meant yelling. That's how long ago I wrote this. Okay. Um, no, seldom is something disproven. We talked about modification, tweaking, um, little things here and there. There's a lot of stuff we look back now and, and say, oh, what were they thinking? Right? It was, it's the same thing. They can do the same thing to us as far as we think we are right now. Uh, there's much technology as we have right now, as much this, that, and the other. As much background information as we have in 100 years, look at what they have to do. Morons. It happens. So what do you get? What do you got? I like this. And I wish I remembered. I told you I wrote this 25 years ago. As of now, this is our accepted explanation of this phenomenon. That's what science gives you. An accepted explanation of whatever the hell it is you're talking about at that moment. What the folks in charge can all agree upon. The majority of the folks in charge of that subject can all agree upon. That's what you guys get. And if that sounds scary or if that makes you nervous or whatever, um, well, make sure you get into the field and and make sure that you're doing the best you can, and then you'll know that uh, at least in that field, it's right. Um, you have to trust, and again, you don't want to hear that word in science. Science isn't about touchy-feely things and emotions and so on and so forth. But you have to trust that the folks in charge of this, the ladies, the men, the, the legions of people out there researching whatever topic you want to insert in that blank, are using every resource and brain cell that they've got to dedicate to that to come up with what they think is how it works. And they're distilling that down and presenting it to you as this is how it works, folks. And then someone in my position reads their stuff and distills it down again and says, this is how it works, folks. That's, that's the process. And, um, and that's why I always get, again, like I said, I, I see a lot of non-science majors, folks that, that say they, they, they hate science or science is scary or science is, usually what you mean is you don't like math because that's a part of science that, that turns a lot of folks off. Um, but science isn't anything scary. 
It's folks who spend a lot of time studying something to try to explain it to everybody else on the planet. All right? And, and like I said, you, a lot of times it's up to the person that's in between them and you that sets that tone for you, that sets that, that flavor. Now, this last thing here, this has been supposedly disproven over the years. People never thought the world was flat. It depends who you listen to. There's still some trolls out there trying to convince people that they think the world is still flat. They have to be trolls. They, they can't, like, be honest. But um, just keep in mind that at one point, when I say here, uh, the most educated minds in science believe that the world was flat and all it took was a few free thinkers to prove them wrong. All right. Um, whether or not that's true or not, you, you, you get the gist. Um, this turns into a conversation about, you know, filtering through information that you're given. Um, way back when, when we thought the world was flat, supposedly, who were the educated folks? We, we, we already talked, it was the rich folks, but who else would the, the they be? It wasn't necessarily big governments. Who was in charge of a lot of places back then? Royalty, all right. Even bigger than the royalty sometimes, though. The churches, all right, the church. Um, and they have a very specific set of rules that they were governed by, right? So when stuff didn't fit in, and, and again, I'm not bad-mouthing, I'm just kind of rehashing what happened. You know, when that kind of stuff conflicted, new discoveries conflicted with what they knew to be truth or they knew to be the way things are, it wasn't met very well, okay? Uh, you know, even as, as simple as beyond there be monsters, um, we, we don't go there. Why? Because we don't go there, okay? Um, you know, to, to just throwing people in prison and, and stuff like that. Um, read your astronomy, you know, first chapter of an astronomy book. You'll learn all about that. It happened. So, I don't want to say it's still happening today, but you guys know, you know, not everybody that's giving you information is, is doing so for your best interest, for your self-improvement. Um, Critical thinking is a word. I don't hear it so often anymore. Hopefully you guys get it in some of your foundational classes still. Um, think about why someone is telling you something whenever you're hearing it, whether it's, it's out in your everyday life, whether it's at work, whether it's in a classroom, or whether you're listening to the TV, radio, or the Internet. Think about why someone is telling you what is their reason for telling you what is their agenda for telling you and keep that equally weighed as the information they just gave you here's this tidbit of information why did this person feel that I needed to know that and always keep that in mind of where it came from okay um, the, the 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 classic example and, it, and it's sort of a, a, a it's a great example and a bad example all in one because it sort of bad mouths the profession. But think about a car dealer for a moment, okay? And if any of your relatives are car dealers, again, I, I apologize. But think about a car dealer. You walk onto the lot and whatever car you happen to be looking at is, guess what? That is the perfect car for you, right? Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's, I could see you driving that down the road. That's a perfect color for your skin and, and so on and, and, and so forth. What's their agenda? Well, they're on commission, right? They want to sell cars, and if you happen to like that thing, whether they know it's a hunk of junk or not, it's perfect for you. They're telling you that because that's what they want to do. Like I said, it's an extreme example. But think about all the other information that's beaming at you, almost through that same lens. Why is this person telling you? Okay, That's our version. That's an updated sort of critical thinking. That's a lens for 
anything, for the love of God, anything you hear science-related coming at you, not just from, from these morons in, in, in politics who are not scientists. And, and mm, it gets frustrating. So um, keep that in mind, okay? All right. So I, I've been talking an awful lot. Um, I haven't really given you guys an opportunity. You went back and forth with me a little bit, and I appreciate that. Do you have any questions about science or how science works or why science sometimes doesn't work or anything like that? All right, well, if you ever do, you know how to find me. And you folks at home that I'm making this recording for, you know how to find me as well. And uh, like I said, we didn't talk about